Good morning, everyone. Um, and in case for some of you will be uh, night if you are in uh, other parts of the world, but here in Australia and in Asia, it's morning. So good morning and welcome to the SIAP uh, uh, seminar, which and this SIAP seminar uh, is uh, co-hosted with the Malaysia, MASA, Malaysia Singapore Society of Australia. So uh, my name is, I'm Dr. Yao Tong Chia. I'm the president of the of MASA as well as the uh, one of the country coordinators for SIAT. Well, SIAT is the uh, stands for Sydney Southeast Asia Center at the University of Sydney. And we are one of the biggest, uh, we are actually one of the biggest centers of Southeast Asia in Australia. And, uh, but before we begin, I'd like also to uh, 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 acknowledge that we are on Aboriginal land. We uh, that are uh, uh, on the land of the Gadigal people of the Yuan nation unceded Aboriginal land and pay our respects to the elders, past and present. So, um, before, uh, and also, I uh, forgot to introduce like uh, MASA. MASA is the Malaysia Singapore Society of Australia, the premier academic association of Australia uh, in the academic study of, uh, of these two countries and which we hope to include also Brunei. So today we have a really... Uh, accomplished scholar working on migration as well as uh, a, a area of migration and education. She's an accomplished uh, geographer, but I'll leave it to the uh, chair to introduce her. Uh, chairing this webinar today is uh, Dr. Jason Ng. He is uh, MASA's, on MASA's committee as MASA of Malaysia rep, and he's also an academic at New Era College and an accomplished uh, historian of uh of Malaysian history. So I'll pass the time uh with that I'll pass the time um to Jason to introduce the speaker and to chair the session. Thank you. All right. Uh good morning everyone and thanks Yoto, for the introduction. So I won't take too much of the time. Uh let me briefly introduce myself and then I'll introduce Dr. Singo. My name is Dr. Jason Ang. Uh my job today is to bring to you a very interesting uh, speaker a very accomplished historian. Uh, she is Dr. Xinyi Go, or Go Xinyi, Chinese naming convention, a, a senior assistant professor in, in the Institute of Asian Studies at University of Brunei Darussalam. Uh, she is also the deputy director of, uh, of, the, of the institute, um, also an adjunct senior research fellow at Monash University. Uh, she is a human geographer of eight plus years postdoc experience in uh, various places such as Hong Kong, Brunei, and Malaysia. Um, she is an expert in migration studies, urban studies, and post-colonial geography. And uh, she, she has a very keen insight about the patterns of migration and how people, capital, um, and culture travel across borders. Uh, just to briefly let you know a little bit, uh, some of the books she, uh, and publications she has done. Uh, she, her, one of her key books is Race, Education, and Citizenship. Mobile Malaysian British Colonial Legacies and the Culture of Migration, uh, published in 2017 by Paul Greg Macmillan. And she is also an editor for several books, such as The New Chinese Migrations, Mobility, Home and Inspiration from Rutledge, uh, The Globalization of Real Estate, The Politics Practice of Foreign Real Estate, and so on and so forth. Quite a lot of books. She's a very pro um, proficient writer, and I am sure she is going to give us a very interesting uh, talk today. Uh, just for those who just joined us first time, just to let you know, uh, today's topic is called Crisis Infrastructuring, Malaysia, My Second Home. Uh, without much further ado, uh, Sini, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jason, and also Yao Tong uh, for the very kind introductions. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen. All right. Okay, uh, so thanks again uh, to Siak and also to Masa for this invitation to uh, share with you uh, some of my uh, research. Um, today I'll be talking about uh, crisis infrastructuring uh, using the case of the Malaysia My Second Home or the MM2H uh, program. And I'm using this case uh, to develop this concept of crisis infrastructuring. Uh, the talk... Sorry. 
The talk uh, is largely based on my recently published paper uh, with the same name, and this is published in Applied Mobilities. It will be part of a, a journal special issue. Uh, so if you're interested, you can read more about the paper here. Um, in this talk today, I will also um, bring in a little bit more additional information uh, in addition to what was already published in the paper. Now, let me first give you an introduction about the MM2H uh, program for some of you who may not be familiar with this program. Uh, this program was uh, um, init uh, initiated uh, in 2002. And since then, this program has been instrumental in establishing Malaysia as uh, one of the most popular lifestyle migration destinations. And in fact, uh, it is the world's most popular, uh, popular retirement and lifestyle migration program throughout the 2010s. Uh, so by now, there has been a uh, developed assemblage of both public and private actors that promote the program. Uh, they facilitate uh, the participants' visa applications and renewals. They also support the visa holders' uh, transnational and local mobilities, as well as their everyday life in Malaysia. And by now, this MM2H migration infrastructure uh, is deeply embedded into other sectors in the Malaysian economy, especially in education, real estate, healthcare, tourism, uh, and retail. However, uh, during this period of 2018 to 2022, the MM2H program came under a series of disruptions, and you can see that uh, summarized in this table. Uh, so for example, during September 2018 to March 20, uh, 2019, about 3,700 applications that were submitted during this time uh, were left unprocessed. Uh, next, during the period of September to November 2019, uh, the applications that were submitted uh, faced an abnorm abnormally high rejection rate of 90%. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, when it started in Malaysia in March 2020, uh, all foreigners, including MM2H visa holders, were disallowed from entering Malaysia. And this has resulted in some of the MM2H visa holders who were at that time overseas. Uh, they became stranded overseas for prolonged periods of time and couldn't return uh, to their homes uh, in Malaysia. In August 2020, there was a sudden uh, un and unexpected official suspension of the MM2H program where new applications were not accepted and ongoing applications were returned. And then uh, after a year of that suspension, in August 2021, there was an unexpected announcement about uh, the transformation of the program into uh, the new, or what is called the Enhanced MM2H program, the EMM2H, that was to be effective in October 2021. Uh, with this transformation, the program now uh, required uh, participants who have higher financial eligibility, which includes a fourfold increase in their minimum offshore monthly income from 10,000 ringgit to 40,000 ringgit. Uh, there was also a new requirement, which is a residency requirement of 90 days per year. Uh, and then a year later in September 2020, there was again another unexpected announcement about the premium visa program, the PVIP, which is a new deri uh, derivative program that uh, targets the wealthy uh, that was to be effective in October 2020. So this recurrent and unexpected disruptions uh, during this period of 2018 to 2022 have unsettled, suspended or derailed uh, existing as well as aspiring applicants' lifestyle migration projects. The disruptions have also affected the MM2H migration infrastructure in terms of business continuity and sustainability as well as their client relations. So in this research, uh, I ask these questions. First, what happens when an established migration infrastructure such as the MM2H uh, infrastructure is perceived to be in crisis? How does the perceived crisis shape the kinds of repair work undertaken by different stakeholder groups? Who is doing what repair, where, and for what purpose? And ultimately, what do all of these tell us about migration infrastructures uh, in crisis? In terms of methodology, uh, this research uh, was conducted in 2021 to 2022 uh, during the program's uh, disruptions and suspensions. 
the research mainly draws from interviews with three groups of participants. So the first group is what I call aspiring MM2H migrants. And this would include individuals who were planning to apply for the MM2H program or uh, they had submitted their MM2H, pro uh, MM2H uh, program applications, but their applications were caught uh, during the suspension. The second group uh, is the existing MM2H migrants, and these are existing MM2H visa holders. And the third group are members of the MM2H migration infrastructure. So this would be uh, intermediaries, MM2H consultants, uh, business owners, uh, representatives of business associations, uh, all of whom are involved in providing MM2H and its related services. Uh, in addition to the interviews, I also supplement uh, that data set with news articles and social media uh, data, and also some participant observations in the webinars that were hosted by members of the MM2H migration infrastructure, especially during the program's uh, suspension and transformation. Before I talk about the research findings, uh, let me just give an overview of the theoretical literature uh, that this research uh, is positioned in. Uh, this research primarily engages with the literature on migration infrastructure that is in the migration studies literature. And in this uh, literature, the migration infrastructure has been well established, uh, as I quote here from Sang and Linquist, the systematically interlinked technologies, institutions, and actors that facilitate and condition mobility. Uh, in this literature, scholars have made distinctions between the migration industry, migration apparatus, and also migration infrastructure. Uh, Linguist and Xiang again, for example, uh, explain that the migration infrastructure is used in application to commercial businesses that thrive on profiting from migration. And by contrast, the migration infrastructure takes a broader perspective. Uh, it doesn't just focus on commercial uh, entities or commercial actors, but it considers uh, the entire ecosystem uh, of um, uh, actors and stakeholders that are involved uh, in a particular migration uh, mobility flow. Uh, it also considers the different dimensions and logics of operation of contemporary migration. Now, in the literature that talks about migration infrastructure, there has been more recent discussions about uh, migrant-led or bottom-up uh, kinds of uh, mobility infrastructures, uh, such as migrant-owned businesses and also how migrants uh, co-produce institutionalized structures. Um, however, there is a shift from looking at infrastructure to infrastructuring. Uh, this uh, shift from looking at uh, infrastructures as like uh, static objects uh, to infrastructuring as a kind of verb, a kind of action uh, is really important because uh, it, it shifts the focus to looking at infrastructuring as a dynamic process uh, through which infrastructures are being reproduced, transformed, remade and reconfigured. Uh, so this also corresponds uh, to observations that infrastructures are processual and always in the making. So they are not static, uh, but the focus on looking at how actors and stakeholders are making infrastructure, like infrastructuring uh, is the key one. So beyond uh, the migration studies literature, I have also looked into the literature that discusses infrastructure more broadly. And here I draw out uh, these three key insights that uh, is relevant to this particular study. The first is that infrastructures become visible upon uh, their breakdown. Uh, so in a sense, this means that infrastructures are always there, but because perhaps they are functioning very well, uh, they are not noticeable. But uh, upon their breakdown, then it, they become visible. Uh, the second insight is the recognition that breakdowns and repair are actually part and parcel of infrastructures. Uh, and in addition to that, the breakdowns and repairs are not necessarily neutral or apolitical. So for example, Graham and Tift uh, write that there is a politics of repair and maintenance. Uh, repair can be understood as a disc discursive or performative practice for maintaining and negotiating order in uh, infrastructural settings. The forms and meanings of repair are also contested and contestable 
due to the presence of divergent and intersecting interests. So for example, on the part of businesses, uh, the state, or different user groups of the infrastructure. And so because of that, the moment of repair then becomes a key moment for the negotiation of power. And repair then becomes a site for divergent and even conflicting views of what form repair might take and whether repair is required at all. The third insight that can be drawn from this literature on infrastructures is that infrastructures uh, have what Larkin calls the uh, duality. Uh, in uh, So there's a duality of infrastructures. Uh, so on the one hand, they have the material or technical component, which could be systems of physical objects, technical experts, and bureaucracy. Uh, and on the other hand, it also has a relational component, and this consists of social networks and also patron-client uh, relations. So if we take uh, these three insights together, we then come to the realization that infrastructural breakdown and disruption actually present opportunities to examine, you know, how actually infrastructures and their politics have been working. Uh, for example, Graham suggests that disruptions and uh, breakdowns in normal geographies of circulation allow us to excavate the usually hidden politics of flow and connection of mobility and immobility. So it is during these moments of breakdown and the blockages of flows that infrastructures together with their assemblages, their networks, their politics become visible and also visibilized. So if we return to uh, this guiding uh, research questions that I mentioned earlier, uh, this study examines how the different stakeholder groups respond to, defend, challenge, and also contest the MM2H program's impending infrastructural breakdown and transformation. The study examines the discursive strategies that each stakeholder group used to advance their positions and concerns in their attempts to, in a sense, rescue the MM2H uh, migration infrastructure and its existing logics of operation. The study advances the concept of crisis infrastructuring to capture the repair work, as well as the exploration of alternatives that have been undertaken by these actors when an established migration infrastructure uh, is perceived to be under threat or in crisis. Uh, in the paper, I argue that it is the perceived moment of crisis that actually facilitated infrastructure efforts in a more uh, unprecedented and also swift manner. So in the case of the MM2H program, uh, in the paper, I make a twofold argument about uh, this concept of crisis infrastructure. The first is that each stakeholder group viewed the program's infrastructural breakdown through their respective lenses of perceived crisis. So meaning that the crisis meant uh, slightly different things to each stakeholder group. And as a result of their different uh, perceptions and interpretations as to what the crisis meant, each group then engaged in different forms of infrastructure work uh, with the purpose to either repair or transform the MM2H program or to explore and create new alternatives that are outside of the existing migration infrastructure. So now returning uh, to the MM2H program, uh, this uh, sort of stylized uh, timeline shows that the program uh, can largely be divided into two phases. In the first phase, you see the steady growth and development of the program, uh, especially after the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture uh, was tasked with the program's promotion uh, starting in 2006. However, for the second phase, uh, which is around uh, 2018 onward, uh, this would be the phase uh, where the program uh, saw uh, infrastructural disruption and the period also overlapped with the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as Malaysia's regime change and political crisis, uh, which uh, saw a change of three governments within the two years uh, um, from 2020. Now, this table shows uh, the number of MM2H participants by their country of origin uh, during the period from 2002 to 2019. 
uh, I have grouped uh, this into like four year periods and I've highlighted here uh, highlighted here two four year periods. Uh, the first is uh, 2010 to 2013 and the second 2014 to 2017. You see that during these two four year periods, the number of participants actually increased uh, quite tremendously. Uh, in terms of economic contributions of this program, uh, there are very mixed reports. On the one hand, you have the Ministry of Home Affairs, MOHA, uh, which says that the program's revenue contribution during this time from 2002 to 2019 uh, was 11.89 billion Malaysian ringgit. Whereas uh, the MM2HCA, which is the uh, MM2H Consultants Association, uh, stated that this program actually contributed 38.17 billion during uh, the same period. Uh, so there's been uh, mixed claims about uh, the economic contributions uh, of the program. Now, the, uh, this particular research project uh, was conducted, uh, especially during 2021, uh, when the program was uh, under the official suspension. Uh, while it uh, underwent the government commissioned consultant review of the program's impact and effectiveness. However, the interesting thing is that uh, neither the MM2H agents, or the MM2H consultants, or the consultant association uh, were informed about the suspension uh, or about the review, and uh, they were actually not involved uh, in the review. Uh, in fact, the suspension of the program, uh, the August twenty uh, August twenty twenty uh, suspension, actually happened uh, very abruptly. The MM two HCA representative that I interviewed recalled that this actually happened in the afternoon of the twenty ninth of June in twenty twenty, when all the agents were informed uh, by the ministry to collect the applications submitted that morning because they will no longer be processed. So it was a, a very sudden. Um, suspension uh, that even all of the consultants and the association were not aware of. Uh, so it meant that the agents were not able to advise their clients uh, regarding the impending suspension or to assist the clients in planning uh, their clients' lifestyle migration plans uh, accordingly. So after uh, that one year of suspension from August 2020 to uh, August 2021, in mid-August 2021, the Ministry of Home Affairs, MOHA, announced 10 new requirements for the enhanced MM2H program. So these new conditions include, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a fourfold increase in the monthly offshore income, a uh, three to fourfold increase in the proof of liquid assets, uh, and so on and so forth, additional uh, financial requirements, and uh, most importantly, a new residential requirement of 90 days per year. Uh, again, this announcement was completely unexpected uh, by members of the MM2H migration infrastructure. None of the agents or the consultant association were informed beforehand. Uh, MM2H consultants and agents were also not provided with any information or guidelines about how the new conditions would be rolled out and whether or how the existing MM2H visa holders uh, would be affected by these new requirements and conditions. So the turn of events that led to the, um, uh, the announcement of this uh, revamped uh, MM2H, uh, MM2H program has been described as a crisis of confidence uh, by some business stakeholders. However, the question is then, what exactly is in crisis and whose crisis is this? So the literature says that crisis can typically generate a contest between frames and counter frames concerning the nature of the crisis, the severity of the crisis, the cause of the crisis, uh, the responsibility for it, and also implications for the future. So in other words, crisis can be used as a kind of narrative device. Uh, crisis can be socially constructed. They can be discursively represented. They can be politically charged. So the MM2H infrastructure, as I said her, uh, earlier, has had like three decades of uh, growth and development. And by this time, it has matured into one that is deeply intertwined with other sectors of the Malaysian economy, including in education, real estate, healthcare, tourism, and retail. So this explains the predominantly economic perspectives that have been taken by the industry and business stakeholders. 
Uh, and indeed, the industry representatives frame the situation as an economic crisis, and in particular, a crisis that could jeopardize Malaysia's standing and attractiveness as an investment, tourism, and lifestyle migration destination. The industry stakeholders' framing of the situation as a crisis of confidence and an economic crisis can be understood as a strategy for them to petition the government to reverse or to review the announced uh, policy changes to the program. However, from the uh, Malaysian government's uh, perspective, and especially represented by MOHA, the Ministry of Home Affairs, the before revamped MM2H program allegedly posed a threat to Malaysia's national security. According to the then uh, Home Minister, the, this national security threat came about because some uh, MM2H visa holders had misused their MM2H visas by treating Malaysia as a transit country for what he called uh, undesirable activities. So to resolve this national security crisis, uh, MOHA introduced enhancements to the MM2H program uh, and I quote here, to ensure that every single new MM2H applicant who wishes to reside in Malaysia is genuine, of a high quality, and able to contribute to the country's economic growth, unquote. So here, in the name of national security, the Ministry of Home Affairs took to the task of repairing uh, uh, what it um, viewed as the flawed MM2H program by imposing higher financial requirements, which it has discursively equated with high quality migrants. Uh, but then for many of the aspiring as well as current MM2H uh, migrants, the infrastructural breakdown and transformation of the program signal a much more personal and familial uh, family kind of crisis. For those migrants who have uprooted my, uh, themselves from their home country and settled down in Malaysia, uh, the potential inability to meet the new financial requirements meant that they might be facing a crisis of losing their only home when their MM2H visas run out uh, in the near future, meaning that they may not be able to uh, meet the new requirements when they would want to renew their MM2H visas. Uh, but more importantly, they thought that it was unfair to apply the new conditions to existing visa holders because this was a breach to uh, the terms of which they had signed up to. So in other words, this was also a crisis of confidence of sorts for them. For aspiring MM2H migrants uh, whose applications were caught in limbo, they faced the crisis of losing access to their preferred and perhaps only lifestyle migration option. Uh, one of the aspiring MM2H migrants that I interviewed explained that uh, it was a five-year plan to move to Malaysia and it wasn't just a whim. Um, this person had actually uh, moved to Malaysia uh, on a tourist visa while uh, he worked on uh, putting in his MM2H application uh, with the help of an agent, but uh, the program was suspended before he could actually lodge uh, a, a, an official application. So he explained that a lot of people who were in the country like him, suddenly m 2 was gone and uh, they really didn't have a plan B. So I've explained uh, how each uh, stakeholder group uh, looks at the situation uh, from their lens of a perceived crisis, uh, different interpretations of uh, the crisis. And as a result of that, then each stakeholder group engaged in different forms of crisis infrastructuring efforts to either repair the impending infrastructural breakdown or to explore alternatives through uh, crafting or making new infrastructural offshoots. I'll just talk about the repair work. In terms of repair work, members of the MM2H migration infrastructure engage in individual as well as collective efforts to lobby the government. These uh, efforts were aimed at preserving and also repairing the existing MM2H infrastructure, which a lot of them view that uh, it's already working well, then why do you need to change it? Uh, the, the lobbying efforts uh, were aimed at reducing the reputational damage to the program and to Malaysia, and also uh, to ameliorate the plights of existing MM2H participants, such as those who were caught uh, over, stranded overseas. So for example, the MM2H Consultant Association held meetings with its members 
the president gave uh, press statements. Uh, he also actively appeared in webinars and TV interviews to spread awareness about the program and its current infrastructure breakdown. One intermediary that I interviewed uh, wrote a brief containing some key points that he thought was relevant and uh, sent it through an intermediary to some of the ministers in hopes that this could, could uh, be uh, could could help with uh, the discussions about uh, perhaps revising or reversing the policy change. Uh, another intermediary formed a task force with other uh, trusted agencies to explore what could be done to help their MM2H uh, clients. So this series of repair work seemed to have worked to a certain extent, and amidst all these pleas and lobbying, uh, the Home Minister switched his tone and said that current MM2H visa holders' cases will be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and following more lobbying and public grievances, the Home Minister then announced that current MM2H visa holders will be exempted from most of the new conditions. They only need to meet the annual processing fee as well as the 90-day per year residence requirement. So meaning that they do not need to meet uh, the higher financial requirements. Uh, in addition to lobbying, there was also uh, some form of emotional repair work that were undertaken by some of the MM2H intermediaries. Uh, these were aimed at pacifying their MM2H clients due to the cumulative loss of trust with the government. So, for example, some intermediaries took on emotional repair work uh, so that uh, this intermediary says, so that the emotional part of the client relationship is also well taken care of. What this means is that uh, these intermediaries uh, spent extra time, effort and care to maintain client trust during the MM2H crisis. The intermediaries' emotional repair work include, for example, maintaining regular communication with individual clients to elevate their concerns, and also providing extra paid or unpaid assistance often after hours and during emergencies. Uh, this was especially the case when clients were actually stranded uh, abroad. Now, these kinds of emotional repair work uh, is actually emotionally exhaustive because the intermediaries themselves were equally frustrated with the lack of information uh, and the rationale regarding the MM2H uh, program's prolonged suspension and also the subsequent transformation. So the intermediaries were caught. Uh, on the one hand, uh, they have the anxious clients who are demanding answers and solutions. And on the other hand, you have the MM2H authorities who are not forthcoming with clear updates and guidelines uh, on what is to be done. Uh, what do all the new policy changes mean uh, for um, the MM2H uh, applicants? So it is the intermediaries who had to perform uh, this additional emotional repair work to build their clients' loss of trust in the reliability of the program uh, in Malaysian government and also uh, Malaysia as a host country. So as the trust and confidence uh, further deteriorated, various stakeholder groups then began to explore alternative solutions. So they started to move away from focusing on repairing the migration infrastructure. By now, they started to look at alternatives that are outside of the existing MM2H migration infrastructure. So for example, uh, the, for the MM2H agents and consultants, this includes exploring potential business collaborations with counterparts in the region, such as in Thailand, Vietnam, and Indonesia. It also includes diversifying their service provisions. So in addition to providing services on uh, MM2H applications, they also provided services such as estate planning, insurance, support for home quarantine. Uh, this is to meet changing client needs and also to mitigate the business risk brought about by the MM2H uh, infrastructural disruption. So for example, this intermediary here says that I'm advising on Sarawak MM2H. I'm also trying to link up with some Thai elite visa agents in Bangkok because if my clients want to move there, I want a piece of the action as well because ultimately uh, they are businessmen and they need to survive. Uh, as for the aspiring MM2H migrants, uh, instead of waiting uh, passively, some of these um, aspiring migrants have taken their own initiative to explore other alternatives. 
So for example, here, as soon as it became clear that the enhanced MMPH program was no longer a viable option uh, to him, uh, this um, aspiring MMTOH migrant engaged an agent in Sarawak to help him with his Sarawak MMTOH application. And at the same time, he also traveled to Thailand under the Sandbox program for what he called a scouting mission to explore Thailand as a potential lifestyle migration destination uh, on behalf of himself and several friends uh, that were in a similar situation. So this example demonstrates the kind of self-help crisis infrastructure that migrants undertake themselves when the existing migration infrastructure fails to meet their expectations. However, here it's also very important to point out that uh, this is a position of privilege. The ability to travel and to embark on a lifestyle migration scouting project, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, was not one that every single migrant can enjoy or exploit. So I'll move uh, quickly to the conclusion. Um, in this research, I have developed and used uh, the concept of crisis infrastructuring as a lens through which to examine the repair work and the exploration of alternatives that were undertaken by different stakeholder groups when the migration infrastructure is perceived to be under threat or in crisis. The research uses a case of the MM2H program uh, showing that uh, this migration infrastructure meant different things to different stakeholder groups. And as a result of the different interpretations uh, of what the migration infrastructure meant, they also viewed the program's infrastructural breakdown and impending transformation through their respective lenses of perceived crisis. And consequently, each of these groups engage in different forms of infrastructuring work to either repair the existing uh, program and infrastructure or to find alternative solutions for the crisis that they were facing. Um, Graham and Triff have noted that uh, when things break down, new solutions may be invented. In the research, I found that in the case of the MM2H infrastructural uh, breakdown, some stakeholder groups engage in uh, various kinds of repair work to rebuild and also to rescue the existing migration infrastructure, whereas others thought outside of the box and looked beyond the shores of Malaysia for alternatives or plan Bs. Instead of being constrained by the breakdown and transformation of the MM2H infrastructure, Migrants and the members of the migration industry are actually actively exploring viable alternatives. They are also forming new alliances. Now, importantly, while these kinds of acts of infrastructuring could have otherwise materialized during normal or non-crisis times, I think it is the perceived moment of crisis that actually facilitated and um, uh, congealed uh, this crisis infrastructuring efforts uh, in an unprecedented and swift manner. The research has also shown that in uh, the case of uh, the MM2H, migrants and the other stakeholders uh, transition firstly from a state of disbelief at the impending uh, infrastructural breakdown and mobility restrictions to a state of collaborative repair work where they actively uh, work either together or individually to try and repair the infrastructure and finally, to a state of exploration of alternative mobilities. So the final state could be described as uh, the rise of crisis opportunism, where different stakeholder groups actively pursue, create, and actualize uh, new kinds of economic and mobility opportunities during a crisis. And this is also true because each crisis can actually be turned into an opportunity. So the framing of crisis infrastructure, uh, infrastructuring reminds us that failure and repair need not be understood as negative developments. They too can lead to positive, creative, and empowering outcomes. So for example, we have seen that the failure of the MM2H program has led to some intermediaries expanding on their service coverage to the region. Uh, while we have also seen uh, the states of Sabah and Sarawak uh, they have quickly capitalized on their own Sarawak MM2H and Sabah MM2H programs to compete in this global lifestyle migration uh, market. So uh, it might be interesting to see how beyond the MM2H case, 
uh, how this conceptual framework of crisis infrastructuring can be also applied to other cases and other contexts. So I will end my presentation here. Uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions and comments. All right. Thank you, Sydney, for the enlightened talk. Um, I'm sure some of us have some very burning questions for you. Um, I forgot to mention this, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to type in the chat, or you may just speak up and ask directly. Um, right now is a Q&A uh, session. So does anybody have anyone, any questions they would like to direct to uh, Sydney for this? If not, um, I would start by putting uh, uh, some some of some of my uh, interests in this. Uh, Cindy, you mentioned that you know, from based on your interviews and people who are quite, I would say, frustrated with the process being suspended, enhanced, and all the red tapes and all that. Uh, is the, the those who have expressed um frustration. Are they from a certain region or is it general across the board? I'm just curious, like because look at the the the, statistics, the chart you gave us, like the breakdown of different countries in Africa. The people you spoke to, are they from certain region when they face this issue? Thanks, Jason, for that question. Uh that's a great question. Uh it's true. Uh the the well, you can see that my sample size is actually fairly small. Uh, and unfortunately, the uh, people that I managed to speak to primarily came from uh, Western contexts. Uh, I wasn't able to speak to people from, uh, let's say, China or Japan or Korea. Um, in addition to the interviews that I conducted, you will see uh, in, let's say, newspaper commentaries uh, and also, let's say, Facebook posts, um, a lot of complaints and uh, airing of frustrations, uh, these were primarily, I think, Westerners. Uh, it doesn't mean that the non-Westerners are not also frustrated. Uh, it might be the case where the non-Westerners may not maybe publicly air their grievances. Uh, but I have also heard from uh, the agents that I spoke to that uh, the East Asian clients, uh, they would just terminate their visa and just leave the MM2H migration uh, program, they would perhaps go to another country. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. Uh, I I don't want to jump to conclusion, but it seems to me Western uh, applicants or you know aspiring applicants would be the one most vocal about that. And um, not so, I mean, that's, that's really interesting. So generally, this MM2H program has always been a, uh, a quite a, a very interesting question for a lot of Malaysians. I would say um, there have been questions about like what is is it viable or is it really helpful? And what you what you highlighted was the, the government's reasoning for uh, suspending and enhancing was to prevent abuse. Uh, but what makes it different compared to a lot of investment visas? Western countries like Australia has some of the highest investment visa program. This is very similar, right? And also for the, for the United States and for UK. So I, I, I'm just curious, like, do you feel, based on your research, and uh, do you feel that this suspension and enhancement is a response to external or, or, or internal pressures? I know you mentioned it, they said national security, but it was not very clear uh, about this. So um, maybe perhaps you can say something about it. Thanks. Uh, so your question is about uh, whether this disruption to the program was responding to any external uh, pressures in light of, let's say, investment migration programs in other countries. Right, uh, right. I, I think in the case of the MM2H program, it's probably more caused by internal pressures. Uh, as I mentioned in the talk, uh, all of these transformations, disruptions and transformations happen at a time when there has been multiple changes of government. Uh, there's also a history of internal politics between the Ministry of Tourism and the Ministry of Home Affairs in terms of which is the ministry who is supposed to have um, 
I guess the the priority uh decision making power on the MMTH program. Um, so I would say that it was primarily in response uh to internal politics, internal pressures rather than external pressures. Mm. Uh, the question of whether MMTH program is a kind of investment migration program. Uh, this this is where it it gets uh a bit confusing. Uh, it's not clearly an investment migration program. Uh, with the more recent changes, you can possibly argue that it's it's trying to head towards the direction of becoming an investment migration program. Um, but it, it started off uh, as a silver hair program, which is primarily a retirement migration program. And as the years went by, uh, the program has sort of mutated. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say that it doesn't clearly know what it wants to be, actually. And okay. as a result of that, you see a whole wide range of different kinds of MM2H participants. You have retirees, you have people uh, with young families who want to send their kids to international schools. Uh, you have people who are perhaps investors and business owners who want uh, to be located in Malaysia because of uh, easier business operations, uh, mm -hmm. for example. So yeah. a, a whole wide range of people. Oh, yes. Interesting you use the word mutation, but I'll come back to that quickly. Uh, you have a question from a member of the audience. Uh, the question is, you mentioned a bit about domestic policies in Malaysia, pol politics in Malaysia that contributed to the crisis. It seems clear that the transfer of the program from the Ministry of Tourism to the Ministry of Home Affairs was a main catalyst for the combination of the crisis. So Home Affairs normally looks after national security and resilience unless if the program was seen as a threat to national security. I wonder why the government transferred the program into Home Affairs portfolio. That's the first question. Second question, were there any implications of power contests or corruption? Well, can you see? All right, thanks, CY, for the question. Uh, so I also briefly touched upon this uh, when I was yeah. answering this question earlier. Uh, so definitely there is uh, the internal politics that um, influence and shaped um the disruptions and changes to the program. Uh this contest between these two ministries uh has been there for a long time. It's not something that is very recent. Uh, Ministry of Home Affairs uh, oh, uh looks into the issue of immigration uh in Malaysia and not just in terms of the MM2H case, but also all sorts of other immigration issues. There has been uh, a lot of um uh, comments about how that means that the government has taken a more defensive stance in looking at immigration issues uh, in Malaysia. Uh, so the transfer from uh, MOTEC to MOHA, um, no one will probably really know what actually happens and why there has been a transfer. Uh, but we just know that there has been internal politics uh, between the two ministries and possibly also uh, between individual uh, politicians and policymakers. Uh, but that is just what that has been happened. Uh, but uh, also interestingly, uh, just about a month or so ago in mid-December 2023, uh, Ministry of Tourism made an announcement to say that we are now going to change the MM2H program again. Uh, now it's MOTEC that made the announcement, not MOHA. So I don't know whether it has now changed back to MOTEC. Uh, but the announcement is that now the MM2H program will have three tiers. It will have uh, gold, silver, and platinum. Um, there are some loosening of requirements uh, with the platinum uh, participants having the potential to apply for permanent residence in Malaysia. So this this is a very, very uh, unexpected and big thing because uh, we know that applying for permanent residence in Malaysia, it's a very difficult process. Uh, but then with the, after the announcement, there were no details. Uh, so there's still a lot of speculation about you know whether this will actually happen, whether people can actually gain uh, PR. Okay. Can, can I follow up with asking, like, do, do you think this is a, uh, I hate to use the military term, a preemptive strike by MOTAC to sort of put a stake on, on how they want to shape the program? Because you mentioned about internal political um, horsemanship happening, right? 
So it sounds to me like, you know, they make announcements, there's no details, and then tell us to wait. Um, could it be just an, an attempt to sort of uh, shape public opinion or to gain, see how the people react to you see that? Or is this a, a, um, a knee-jerk reaction to a, a pressing crisis where you see a lot of people shifting to Thailand, as you mentioned, you know, as being an altern attractive alternative, right? Mm. I I don't think it is an announcement that was made uh, just to stake a claim. Uh, I believe that there has been some discussions uh, and some decisions made uh, at the government level. Uh, making an announcement and not following up with details, this has been a recurrent pattern that we have seen. Uh, so perhaps uh, the decision has been made, but uh, the details have not yet been ironed out. Uh, I hope that actually there has been uh, consultations happening uh, behind the scenes uh, because um, the consultants and also the consultant uh, association, they really understand, uh, they, they are the bridge between the applicants, the migrants, visa holders, uh, as well as the government, the authorities. So they will be able to convey, uh, you know, two-way communication of what each of the stakeholder groups are Co uh, concerned about, mm -hmm. um, they would be able to highlight, uh, let's say, you know, this this new suggestion is great, but then how do we actually uh, implement it? Uh, maybe these are ways to implement. I hope that all of these consultations are happening on the ground uh, mm -hmm. so that then eventually it's not just, uh, you know, big announcements, but that it could actually be translated to implementation. Okay, right. Uh, that, that's probably hope that I mean that's the hope for it. Um, I like to go back and talk a little bit about how you how you mentioned about how well we all know it, you know as Malaysians we know how difficult it is to get a PR here and how the process is is a grueling marathon and involves a lot a lot of uh, time energy and money. Um, it's funny because um maybe maybe I'm I'm going a little diverging a little bit, but it, it, you recall the digital nomad visa, right? And okay, the MM2H is meant to attract people with money to settle and sort of invest here, but yet they don't really make it easy for you to settle down, you know, a PR. As you mentioned, people come here because the cheap medical care, cheaper, I wouldn't say cheaper, cheaper medical care, affordable uh, education, for, you know, our international school rates may be uh, expensive for locals, but it may not be for investors. Uh, yet then we see this digital nomad visa we're supposedly attracting all these so-called influencers and TikTokers coming in. Do, do you see uh, maybe a, a shift towards that kind of visa? Or is this, are they competing? Or maybe they're supposed to complement each other? I mean, I, I see when, when, I, when I realize that there's this digital nomad uh, visa thing going on, I'm like, what about MM2H? How, how's that going to help our country, you know? So could you say something about that, Sim? Mm. If I understand it correctly, the digital nomad visa is not under MOHA, it's not under MOTEC, it's probably under MDEC. Oh, um, I, I think, yeah. So again, here you see different ministries with um, different priorities and different aims uh, introducing different kinds of initiatives. Uh, so I... I don't know what kinds of coordination uh, the digital nomad visa has uh, with MOHA and with immigration. Um, yeah, that, that, that is actually a recurrent problem as well where you have different uh, policies with different aims uh, championed by different ministries, yet there is perhaps a lack of um more coordination uh so that then it, it then seems a coherent uh, you know policy at the national level instead of at uh, individual ministry levels mm -hmm. sounds like um every every ministry is competing to to sort of showcase their <clears throat> their project to attract talents and, and money so to speak and I, I find that a bit confusing for for people in here so. What 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 they're doing is I thought MM two is supposed to bring all these people in. Yet um okay, putting that aside, I I, I just curious like uh maybe I maybe I missed that statistic part about uh because I want to draw attention to Singapore, which is very interesting. 
but being the nearest neighbor, a more affluent place, you know, arguably. Uh, how, how much has this been popular by Singaporeans? I mean, many Singaporeans have Malaysian ties. I don't think they have an issue with that. But do you see uh, more and more Singaporeans taking MM2H or are they just going to ignore it and just continue as usual? How's that? There, there are Singaporeans uh, who apply and uh, get on the MM2H program. Uh, I've also spoken to Singaporeans who have migrated to Australia uh, and who are now considering MM2H uh, visa as a way to sort of return. Oh, oh uh, okay. Interesting. After Australia. So yes. Uh, so yes, there, there are Singaporean participants as well. Uh, but with the with, with the newer and higher financial requirements, I'm not sure whether the program will still uh, attract you know, uh, existing pools of participants. Fascinating you mentioned that Singapore is in Australia want to retire in Malaysia. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, and and, and, and and that's the thing as well, because um uh for Malaysians who have migrated to another country and perhaps married a foreign spouse, it was very difficult for them to return to Malaysia. Or perhaps ah. the for the Malaysian citizen who has taken up uh another citizenship. So oh, in the past, there were some people who applied and got on the MM2H program as a way to return to Malaysia under the MM2H program. Okay, interesting. We'll, we'll come back to that. Maybe we can talk after that. I have two, two, uh, two participants with questions. One is my colleague, uh, Dr. Alex Tay. He asked that, is there any need for comprehensive studies to assess the significant economic impact of the MM2H program on Malaysia's economy? For instance, focus on analyzing the contributions of MMPH participants to various sectors such as real estate, retail health and tourism, as well as the overall effect on employment, investment, and economic growth. And second, by an anonymous attendee, I'll, I'll let you uh, answer whichever you feel like. Uh, the question by this anonymous person is that I have questions around the relationship between immigration and real estate industry. How much is real estate involved with M within MMPH policies? Can you tell us about MMPH relationship with properties? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so Alexander's question, yes, definitely there's a need for a comprehensive study. Uh, as I said in the talk just now, there are, you know, differing claims about how much is the uh, economic contribution of the program. Uh, the, the thing about the program is that perhaps uh, there is a lack of data collection in terms of, uh, let's say, existing participants, uh, how much they spend, this and that. Uh, I hear from my interviews that uh, there was a survey uh, that I think Motec sent out a couple of years ago uh, that asked quite detailed questions about uh, the financial uh, expenditure. Um, but uh, because the survey was supposed to be anonymous, but at the end of it, they asked for the MM2H visa number. Uh, a lot of people abandoned uh, the survey and did not complete it. Um, so, yes, although there, there is an effort to collect data, but perhaps uh, it could be better implemented. Uh, but yes, I do agree that we need a comprehensive study. Uh, and to the second question, the relationship between uh, MM2H and properties. Uh, so again, here, we don't know because we don't know, have, we don't really have the numbers uh, to tell us a clear picture. Uh, but from what you hear uh, in the news and also social media, uh, a lot of the property um, industry stakeholders have been claiming that MM2H participants uh, contribute a lot in terms of real estate uh, property acquisition or rental. Um, but again, we do not really have the numbers, so I can't say whether this is really true. And if it's true, what's the proportion amongst all the MM2H participants? Thanks, Cindy. That, I think the, the last question you answered very, very fascinating. Given that we have this report about Malaysia's housing crisis, about over oversupply, and yet, yet we're still building, and yet then we're supposed to have this um, and then the people coming to invest and, and, and sort of um, help alleviate this crisis by buying more properties. But yet, they, you know, they set the threshold in such a level. You know, these are supposed to be premium housing, housing that goes to these investors, but I don't see them going down anytime soon. So I think that's also something, something that really boggles the mind, right? What's going on, actually, right? So... um. 
I, I like to, well, since there's no question, I'd like to go into uh, follow, I mean, build on what Alex's questions are. Do, do you see uh, some, I mean, based on your interviews and research, are there MM2H applicants who, who come, who try to come here because of the medical or, or education uh, attractiveness? Uh, we know Malaysia's medical care is affordable, it's quite high quality. Um, I mean, medical tourism is a big thing. And also education, you know, I, I've seen many, many uh, uh, families from Middle East and you know, East South Asia, even from the West who come here for education as well. What, what, what do you see that as, as a core factor for this MM Jewish program to continue? Uh, well, the mm 2 h program uh, has many different kinds of pull factors for different demographics of people. Uh, definitely, there are people who are pulled by uh, the more affordable healthcare. There are people who are pulled by the more affordable uh, education costs, uh, especially for sending um, um, kids to, let's say, international schools. Uh, and also the fact that in Malaysia, the... Um, the sort of uh, conundrum between quality versus uh, cost in terms of that uh, Malaysia's educational offerings is seen as quite good in terms of the, that balance. Um, but in terms of people coming for healthcare, for example, uh, MM2H migrants will also need to take up um, healthcare insurance, and which is quite expensive too. Um, so I've spoken to some um, people who are maybe of uh, an older age and for them, especially those who come from the UK, for example, uh, the plan is actually to return to the UK eventually when they grow older because uh, they would have NHS. Uh, they would rather rely on that than uh, rely on, I guess, paying much more uh, mm. for the service in Malaysia by the time they grow older. I see. That's interesting to talk about medical care. I've, I've met uh, people from the UK, from colder countries, they say they love it here because of the weather. And they say despite the higher cost, it's still cheaper than where they come from and all that. Uh, but that, that's that's really medical. The medical side is something that's also attracts some people in the weather, climate, really. Okay, uh, thanks for that, Sydney. Uh, we have time for one more question, one final question. Before we close, does anybody would like to venture um, a question? You know, this is your final final chance. Anything you'd like to know about seeing his research, his work, or anything you'd like to know? All right. Okay, maybe I close this with, 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 with one last question. Now, you mentioned about some people shifting to other countries, but especially Thailand, being, you know, the currency has changed and all that. Do you see MM2H uh, being in danger of being overtaken by Thailand's attractiveness? I mean, Thailand have similar programs, right? I mean, not really exactly similar, but you know what I mean? You know, something that attracts the investors. What, what, what do you have to say about this? Well, um... Globally and regionally, there is competition, uh, but with each place, it comes with its own unique combinations of things. And the unique combinations of things uh, could be very attractive or it could be seen as a push factor as well. So Malaysia compared to, let's say, Thailand, um, for the people that I spoke to, Malaysia is still very attractive. Uh, not just uh, the physical things like uh, weather and, and food and uh, culture, but also the ability uh, for them to speak English and mm -hmm. have rules and regulations in English and in particular uh, property rights uh, in a way that they can understand. Uh, whereas compared to other countries, let's say Thailand or, or Vietnam, for example, uh, it's seen as uh, perhaps not as secure or maybe uh, not as easy for them to navigate. So nice. in the sense, Malaysia will still have its own unique strengths. And uh, if the new changes to the MM2H program, uh, you know, if, if it's able to sort of move towards the more um, attracting applicants' um, perspective, then uh, it might reverse whatever damages that has been done. It might alleviate the crisis too, to a certain extent, right? Yeah. 
All right. Thanks. Thanks for the senior. I think that the, the questions and the comments you in, in your presentation have given us a bigger picture, a clearer picture of what's going on. And I think uh, the Malaysian government has its homework cut off for them. You know, you just put up a, an assignment for them. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to extend um, Masa and also CX uh, thanks to you, Sini, for a very enlightening talk this morning. Um, and also for our, our, audi our audience attendees, both anonymous and also those who are here. Thank you for your uh, participation. Uh, it's been really uh, enjoyable and very educational uh, moment for this. Now, uh, without much further ado, let me pass the time back to uh, Master President uh, Yeo Dong for a final word and then we'll, we'll close it. Right. Yeo Dong, take care. With that, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, attending this uh, webinar. Um, a special thanks to uh, Singi for a really interesting and lighting talk and a special thanks to uh, Dr. Jason, to Jason for uh, your really good uh, chairing and moderating. So um, so to uh, keep a uh, uh, look at uh, Masa and also Siak uh, um, social media posting for our future events and uh, seminars and webinars. But with that, I would like to say uh, a good morning and good afternoon and good evening wherever you are thank you all of you for attending so goodbye <laughs>